So now let's see our five year experience together with this topic of pharmacogenomics in clinical practice, the five years experience in Thailand by Associate Professor Cholapat Sukhasem, Director of Division of Pharmacogenomics and Personalized Medicine. Uh, Department of Pathology, Faculty of Medicine, Ramatipati Hospital, Mahidon University. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a big round of applause to welcome Associate Professor Cholapat Sukhasem. So, um, thank you very much for a nice introduction for me. Um, so th this is the last, se last session before we have lunch times. And so hard for me to talk to you uh, nearly lunch time. And this, this is not the lunch symposium, so we don't provide a lunch box for you, but we have lunch after. So um, I'm looking for my, uh, my fan club. Where is you? Let's your hand, please. OK, oh, it's over there. So don't, don't worry. They don't disturb you. Don't make voice or noise for you. OK, I try to finish my uh, presentation on time. Um, so today, um, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it is my great honor to stand before you today to talk about the um, um, how, how can we translate the clinical, uh, clinical research from pharmacogenomics into the clinical practices. And I will share you what is a clinical issue that should be considered when you implement the pharmacogenomic in the clinical practices. And also, I will conclude you about the uh, key elements, how to succeed uh, to implement the pharmacogenomic in the clinical practices as well. So. As we may know that uh, pharmacogenomic is a study of human genes that involve with drug response and at, it can be uh, categorized into two groups, the efficacy and ADR, and so that's why pharmacogenomic is a, is a three main components between uh, human genes, drugs, and response from that drugs. And so as we know that drug response is come from pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. So that's why US FDA categorized the, the pharmacogenomic marker into two groups according to uh, pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamic involvement. For example, like these tables. And so uh, in La Matipadi Hospital, we um, well, was well established the uh, pharmacogenomic research in 2004. And in 2011, we was well established the pharmacogenomics in the clinical implementations as well. So we try to, to prove up concept. How can we do bench from, be, from bench to bedside from research to the clinical practices? And so now we, we are now go ongoing to do the research, but our research is come from the clinical problems. So that's why it's a cycle of the research and clinical implementations. And um, in Ramatipiti Hospital, we set up the division of the pharmacogenomics and personalized medicines, which is belong to the Ramatipiti Hospital, Mahidon University. And in our laboratory, is located in the new building of Ramatipiti Hospital, which is called Somdet Pateparat Medical Centers. At the fourth floor, for the laboratory of the division of pharmacogenomic and personal life medicines, we have three sections that work together to try to uh, put effort to uh, implement the pharmacogenomics to in the clinical practices. The first, uh, I, I, the first one is a pharmacogenomics lab, which is a genotyping core labs. And the second one is the therapeutic drug monitoring and enzyme activity, especially for TPMT enzyme activity. And the last one, I think that this, is, this section is the most important, uh, how to implement the pharmacogenomic in the clinical practice, it, which is called pharmacogenomics clinic. And so the, the three main sections that we work together to put uh, for the implementations. And this is a sample of our test uh, uh, our test now that provide in the clinical services is about 50 uh, pharmacogenetic testing now. And I can be categorized the, our service into two groups uh, according to um, how to implement in the clinical practice. The first group of the uh, pharmacogenetic testing is the test to identify the patients 
who might get risk of severe cutaneous adverse drug reactions. And for this kind of pharmacogenetic testing, we prefer to screen the patient before. And if the patient positive for the markers, the, the doctor should be avoid to prescribe the drug uh, to that patient. But if they are the negative for the pharmacogenetics marker, uh, physician uh, might uh, the, the drug can be prescribed for that patient safely. And the second one uh, for our pharmacogenetic testing is the pharmacogenetics to identify the appropriate dosing for each patient. So, so you can see that different from the previous one because for this one we categorize, we group the patient into two groups. Uh, the first group cannot use the drug but the second group can use it safely, but for this kind of testing, all of the patient can use it according to their metabolisms. We can vary uh, the dose according to appropriate to, to their genes. And so here for five years, uh, from 2011 until 2015, you can see that the test is, has increased for year by year, but almost of the test is the test for to identify the patients who might get risk of severe cutaneous adverse drug reaction, that is about 70%. So that therefore today, I will focusing on just the, a, a pharmacogenetics marker of uh, to identify the patients who might get risk of severe cutaneous adverse drug reactions. And as you may see here today, I will uh, talk to you about the pharmacogenetic testing for carbamazepines, allopurinols which is the most important because it's a top ten, in the top 10 of drug-induced uh, Steven Johnson syndrome and 10 uh, that reported from pharmacovigilance as Dr. Wimon already mentioned. And the last one that I would like to talk to you is a new one. Uh, um, it's a pharmacogenetic screening for abacavir, which is a very high increase uh, in these years. And so as I mentioned that, you can see from the, uh, from the pictures here, um, Allopurinol and carbamazepine is the top two and top ten of drug-induced Steven Johnson syndrome in Thai, and it uh, is luckily in Thailand because we have a study, uh, and we know that HLA-B star 1502 is a marker for carbamazepine, and also HLA-B 5801 is a specific marker for allopurinol in Thai populations. Unfortunately, if you look into the data here you can see that in Thai populations, we have a lot of uh, genetics marker. A leaf frequency of the in Thai population is about 15 to, to 16 in our Thai populations. And so I might first start about the carbamazepines. Uh, for the carbamazepines, uh, original study is come from Taiwan groups. They study in Han Chinese, and they found that uh, HLA-B1502 is a strong associated with uh, carbamazepine induced Steven Johnson syndrome. The odd ratio is about 2,500. And so by Professor Chung, who sit between Professor Vigita and here. And so after that, Professor Vigita do the replication study in our Thai population to confirm that HLAB star 1502 is, a is strong associated with uh, carbamazepine induced Steven Johnson syndrome in Thai. And therefore, this marker can be a screening testing for our Thai populations. And so you, and further study from by, prof, by prof, Professor Chung, uh, they classify the patients into, uh, according to the phenotypes. And they found that just only Steven Johnson syndrome show associated with uh, HLAB star 1502, but other phenotypes such as dress or MPE is not uh, associated. And then we are now don't know yet what is a marker for the other phenotype of uh, severe cutaneous adverse drug reactions. And so for the implementation of pharmacogenetics, the clinical issue that should be considered that uh, the phenotype specific of HLA-B star 1502 for carbamazepine uh, induced scar. And um, I have one experience to our case study. Uh, this female got carbamazepine induced dress and also physicians uh, would like to use uh, 
this marker to confirm that uh, her diagnosis for Kabama spin induced scar. And so she sent a sample to us, and when she got the, the result, and in actually she expect that she will get a positive for HLB star 1502. But when we send the result to her, and she called to me that, so um, I'm so disappointed for your, your test because it cannot be positive for my case. So that's why I have to talk to her that when you look into the, when you look into the data, that show the true one, the right one. Uh, HLB star 1502 cannot identify the patients who might get risk of Kabama spin induced stress from the research. Therefore, we said we can say that it's phenotype specific. And after that, we got another case study. This case study already uh, in actually they screen for the patients before pres prescribed Kabama spin for these patients, and. This patient got negative for 1502. And after that, she got dressed after 14 treatment. So therefore, we revised our report according to that case because we know that uh, the 1502 cannot identify the patients who might get risk of dress. So in the report, we identify, we uh, clarify what is the limitation of uh, the pharmacogenetic testing query and uh, but however when you look into the, the, the pictures here this is a data from pharmacovigilance Kabama has been induced threat is very rare in Thai populations and I already asked Dr. Wichitra that you but she said that she never seen she never found uh, Kabama has been induced threat in her cohort but in our in Bangkok zone we found two cases now and I, I can confirm that it's very rare cases for Kabama spin induced dress for our Thai population. And another issue that should be concerned when you implement the pharmacogenetics in the clinical practices, because when you look into the data, you can see that 1502 is a positive for a, a specific population, for example, like Han Chinese, Thai, Indian, Malaysian, Singapore, and Malaysia. But for uh, other Asian populations su such as Japanese, Korean, European, and Caucasians, they have a different marker. And so one of my experience, I got a sample from Japanese populations uh, who admit at private sector hospital in Thai populations. But the clinician don't know about this information. They send the sample to test 1502 for, for, her, uh, for, for these patients. And when I look into the names, and I found that it's a Japanese name, so I called to, to the physician that if you screen for 1502, it might not be useful for this patient. It, might, it cannot identify the risk of that patient. So that's why we change the test. Uh, we customize the, the test according to the ethnic city for the Kabama recipients. If the patient is a Japanese, we do the testing for HLAA3101 for that patient. So when you look into our request uh, order, we, we encourage the physician to identify the ethnic city for, for their patients as well. That can be prevent the missing of the pharmacogenetic testing as well. And so the, the three, issue number three that I would like to talk to you today, as we may know that 1502 is a member of HLAB 75 and in the family of HLAB 75, so you can see that they have another, another HLAB allele that can be a, a risk factor, a risk marker for Kabama spin in due dress. Because from a study by Professor Hung, who is wife of Professor Chung, uh, her, her found that another uh, gene marker can be a risk factor for Kabama spin in due dress by in vitro study. And so I might be concerned about the pharmacogenetic testing because now the pharmacogenetic testing for uh, 1502, they have two kind of testing. The first one is a specific marker. If you do the specific marker, you can identify the patients who positive or negative of 1502. But if you do another kind of test, which is called HLAB genotyping, you can see the genotyping of that patient. And so from case study, I found from one hospital, these patients 
already done for screening of 1502 specific marker and that time they got a negative result for 1502 and they prescribed carbamazepine for this this case this patients and 14 after after treatment this patient got Steven Johnson syndrome from carbamazepines when we look into the HIV genotyping for these patients we found that this guy carry 1521 which is the member of HLAB 75. So that's why I encourage to use HLAB genotype instead of a specific marker because otherwise you will lose this guy from your prevention. And in 2014 in Thailand, so we, as we know that 1502 is a specific marker for carbamazepine in our Thai populations. So in, our, in 2014, we implement the pharmacogenetic screening of 1502 before prescription of carbamazepine. Uh, this is the data from our labs. And so we found that uh, negative of HLAB 1502 in our Thai population, we never seen carbamazepine uh, induced Seven Johnson syndrome from our cohort, but for another uh, another group of patients, uh, we found that uh, some of patient is about thirteen percent they carry HLAB fifteen O two, and from these uh, patients, seven patients uh, was prescribed the alternative drugs, and one of alternative drug that uh, physician used for these patients is oxcarbamazepines. And this patient got Steven Johnson syndrome after. And another case is uh, the patients who positive of 1502, but they can they was prescribed for carbamazepines. And I will talk to you in the details of these two study later. But so this is very sad story for our Thai population. Even we already screened the patients, and we found that they carry the marker, but carbamazepine will be. Uh, um, uh, was prescribed for that for such patients. So first one, for oxcarbamazepines, as we know that oxcarbamazepine is a similar structure of uh, carbamazepines. When the patient get oxcarbamazepines, uh, oxcarbamazepine will uh, metabolize in that in that patient's body to be uh, carbamazepine structures. So that why carbamazepine and oxcarbamazepine share a pharmacogenetic risk factor. 1502 can be a marker for oxcarbamazepine as well. As you see that, the odd ratio of oxcarbamazepine and 1502 is about 20, 27.4. Uh, so oxcarbamazepine, it might not be a good choice for the patients who carry 1502. And so as you see in our pharmacogenetic cards, so from this case study that we, uh, we got a, a Steven Johnson syndrome from oxcarbamazepine. Therefore, we revise our card to identify for the pharmacogenetic interpretations in, this pa in our patients after we do the screening that if the patients carry 1502, they might get risk, a high risk of carbamazepine and oxcarbamazepine as well. And as I mentioned about the sad story of that patient who screened for 1502 and positive, and she got carbamazepine after what happened in that in that patients because when we, they do the screening the patient was admitted at IPD wards however when she come to follow up at OPD wards in that setting they don't link the, the information of the patients between IPD and OPD so that why physician who in charge at OPD was. They don't know that this patient is a 1502 positive. So they prescribed, this, page, this physician prescribed carbamazepine for, for these patients. Therefore, she got carbamazepine, even she positive for 1502, and she got 10 after 14 days. And finally, she died from, from carbamazepine induced toxic epidermal necrosis. So that's why I would like to how can we solve this? So in that setting, we go to that setting and talk to, to them and let them define a stakeholder, which who is a stakeholder for pharmacogenetics testing, testing in the clinical implementation. The first one is a clinician, pharmacist as well, and also the laboratory as a method, and also patients. They, have, they can 
uh, prevent themselves. So that why, so after they do the defy stakeholder, they already defy the stakeholder, and they defy the role of each each stakeholder well, and then uh, set up about the flow of communications, and also electronic health record might be a uh, useful for this case study, and also pharmacogenetic card and personalized medicines can be help can be a, a tools to prevent uh, the incidents, and so when we do the screening for every case we develop the personalized report for each patient and also the pharmacogenetic card and in that case when we talk into that hospital setting all of the report and pharmacogenetic card is still deposited in the IPD card they don't they don't distribute to the patients as we expected so that why that patient they don't know yet and any information for, for themselves. So, so for the pharmacogenetic card, we, uh, uh, if you would like to do the details, you can go to the editorial articles uh, in the pharmacogenomics that we, I and Dr. Watson wrote together, but they don't have a uh, picture of Dr. Watson because he don't handsome enough to put the pictures. Okay. And so, may I conclude about the 1502 and carbamazepines. So, um, the family risk factor of carbamazepine is not just only 1502, but another in the HLAB 75 should be considered, and the technique to detection should be should be defined, should be considered as well, and they might share a risk marker with another aromatic group, for example, like oxcarbamazepine. That is a not is not a good choice for the alternative drug if the patient's positive for 1502. And also, it, it is an ethnic-specific city. If you receive the sample from uh, other populations such as Japanese, Korean, and European, you should consider not 1502, but each HLAA 3101. And phenotype-specific should be uh, communicated for the patient and, and, and physicians. And this is a the picture show the, uh, the number of testing when we uh, but year by year, and you can see that it's very high. But for these two years, it's, it's a very high peak because uh, it is a year for the pharmacogenetic screening implementation. But in, in this year, for six months, the decrease of the risk uh, uh, for samples because uh, we don't have any uh, government support for each patient. And for the second drug that I would like to talk to you today is about allopurinols. Uh, from allopurinols, it is original study from Han Chinese group, from Taiwan group by Professor, uh, Professor Chung as well. And they found that uh, uh, 5801 is a specific marker for allopurinol induced Steven Johnson syndrome and 10 dress as well. But from Thai study by Professor Vijit Dra, uh, uh, she have just only a case of seven and ten at that time. So that's why when we learn from carbamazepine, we, we know that it's a spe phenotype specific. So that's why we uh, might cannot um, conclude about the broad spectrum of 5801 for aeropinol in Thai population. Otherwise, we, we have a, a, a the study. So uh, from my study, I collect the case of dress and MPE from Thai populations. And we found that 5801 might, can be a strong marker for uh, allopurinol induced Steven 10 dress and MPE in our Thai population, SMS in Han Chinese. And so when you look into the data of uh, pharmacovigilance, you can see that allopurinol is a top two of allopurinol induced stress in Thai population. Therefore, this study can uh, can use and can can be translated into the clinical interpretations of the pharmacogenetic testing for 5801. And so the issue that should be concerned that uh, the ethnic non-specific city for allopurinol and 5801 because from man various study in various population they found that the 5801 is a strong marker is a positive marker for our our population now, for example, like uh, Korean, Japanese, and Caucasians as well. 
and others should be considered now because we have another study. In actually, from the theory, we know we we believe that uh, severe cutaneous adverse drug reaction is dose independent. But from this study, they found that those might be a factor for allopurinols induced severe cutaneous adverse drug reactions. And they found that if the patient treated with more than 200 milligram per day, they have a high risk compared with the patient who treated with low risk of 200 milligram of allopurinols. And in our Thai population, we also study and found that in Thai population, if the patient took the drug about 220 milligram a day, they have a high risk of allopurinol induced scar in, in our population. So therefore, it might be those related with allopurinol induced uh, scar in, in, uh, in, in the patients. And from the American rheumatologists, they recommend to, to starting dose of allopurinol about 100 milligrams when you starting the allopurinol in the patient, especially for the patient who have a renal toxicity, because we know that allopurinol is uh, excreted from uh, by by uh, uh, renal functions. And for the summary of 5801 in our type populations in in the pharmacogenetics implementations, the first uh, 5801 is ethnic non-specific city. It can be a pharmacogenetics marker for a various populations. Mm -hmm. And it's non-phenotype -spe non specific CD. It can be identified the patient who might get list of 7, 10, dress, and MPE. And also, it might be dose related. So therefore, we recommend to start the, to starting dose of aeropinol about 100 milligrams. And especially for the patient who is chronic insuffi renal insufficiency, Pharmacogenetic testing should be screening for that patient. And the last drugs that I would like to talk to you, uh, in actually the incidence of uh, scar from abacavir is not high in our Thai populations because this this is a, a new one for our Thai population. And from the guideline, it is the alternative choice. It is the second choice of. Uh, HIV treatment in our Thai populations. So as we as we may know that uh, HIV staff uh, 5701 is a specific marker for abacavir from Caucasian study. However, in our national guideline in Thailand in 2014, they recommend to screen 5701 in in a Thai. HIV infected patients before before prescribed abacavir in HIV infection patients. So, uh, when you look into the preference of 5701, it's about three to four percent in our Thai population. It's, it is not so high. However, uh, in these years, the National Health Security Office required the pharmacogenetic screening for abacavir before prescriptions of these drugs from the, uh, from the patients. So that's why uh, now the, if the physician would like to prescribe abacavir for HIV infected patients, they should be screened for uh, 5701 before and submit the result to the uh, National Health Security Office before they allow to prescribe abacavir in that patients. And so that's why in this year, just only six months, you can see that the trend of the uh, sample received in our lab is very high. Just only six months, if compared with the last years. So I might uh, conclude that the uh, national agency uh, now in Thailand, they require to test off the specific marker of abacavir, which is uh, 5701 before prescription of abacavir. And the guideline and national agency play an important role for pharmacogenetic implementations. And also in this case, uh, also pharmaceutical company might, might play a role because now in Thailand, abacavir price is very low because pharmaceutical company decrease the price until it is comparable with the roll call made of the uh, anti-HIV drugs. And also, you know, pharmaceutical companies support the patient to screen uh, uh, the test. Uh, pharma pharmaceutical company pay for that patient. Okay. 
and so I would like to conclude about the key elements of the pharmacogenetic testing in uh, clinical implementations by this slide. And if you would like to 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 do the de uh, to see the details, you can go to these articles. The first one, definitely, if you would like to implement the pharmacogenetics in the clinical practice, you should have pharmacogenetic infrastructures. For example, like laboratory, uh, and for in my, I think that pharmacogenetic clinic is is important setting as well, and you should have a pharmacogenetic testing uh, that is included in the pharmacogenetic infrastructure. And also the second one, you should have a pharmacogenetic tools, for example, like pharmacogenetic card, and the personalized medicine report, and also the interpretation system should be developed. And the three key elements is pre and post pharmacogenetic counseling. The fourth one, pharmacovigilance system should be well established, as we in Thailand we have. And the fifth one, electronic electronic medical record can be uh, should be integrated about the pharmacogenetic results in in the electronic health record. And the fourth, uh, the sixth one about the training program for the pharmacists. As we know that pharmacists play a major role for uh, the pharmacogenetics. Uh, testing in the clinical implementation. So that's why the training program for pharmacists to be the pharmacogenetician is might be an important. And the last one, as we know that knowledge and education should be encouraged for a professional, uh, health professionals, uh, for our stakeholders. Um, so that's why we provide the service, a, a training center for uh, health professionals uh, who come to visit in our labs. And also, if you would like more information, you can contact to me by emails or by, um, and if you would like to, to see the details of our labs, you can go to this website. And this website is not finished yet. I just signed a contract to, to develop the website yesterday. So uh, please looking for that. And so if you would like to request the pharmacogenetic testing, um, we require the EDTA blood, just only three to six mil, and the turnaround time is about three days. If you need that test, if you it's an emer emergency test, we can do just only one day. At least send the sam uh, the report to you, and also this is our mobile contact, and it's very welcome you if you would like to visit our setting at the first floor of Ramatibadi Hospital. And I would like to thank you all of my staff here, uh, all of my students, uh, my colleagues, and my granting agency. And thank you for your all for kind attention. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, any question, please? Any? No? I, I just want to, to thank Dr. Chalapas for very nice work that he has been done from transforming the knowledge that we got from the bench to bedside seemed to be very successful. But as you see from his presentation, even though we have the pharmacogenetic test, there are some limitation of pharmacogenetic test, for example, of HLA-1502 or HLA-5801. Some of the tests has ethnic specificity. Some of the tests has scar phenotype specificity. So we need, we still need more help from physician from from pharmacist to explain this to the patient as well. So pharmacogenetic test could not tell opioid scar by itself if you not understand the limitation of the test. So we still need a lot of help from from the uh, I mean healthcare uh, professional uh, practitioner um, to 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 bring the knowledge to the patient as well. So I think Dr. Chulapan had shown very nicely uh, what is the limitation for each um, pharmacogenetic test, particularly for prevention of scar. And then I think um, in the near future, 
we might make use of this genetic test much more for prevention and the patient will have safety duck uh, in the near future. Thank you for your suggestions. Very good. And any more questions? All right, ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for Associate Professor Chalapat Sukhasem. And this is the update for the five-year experience of the pharmacology uh, genomics in clinical practice in Thailand. So, are you hungry? A lot, me too. <laughs> All right, and now it's time for lunch. We are going to have lunch together on the second floor. The restaurant is called 27 Bite. Mm -hmm. And I will stop waiting for you over there on the second floor. Please bring your lunch coupons that you already, we already given to you uh, when you register. But if you don't have the lunch coupon, please register at the registrations. Uh, turn right and you will see the registration booths over there. And you will get the coupon. And please kindly fill in the feedback form and submit to us uh, at the registration too. And thank you very much for your cooperation. And in the afternoon, we have, we will have the breakout section. The first room, in this room, you will find many interesting topics of the pharmacogenomics uh, study. And for the second room is the closed group that will be on uh, the third floor at the suite room. สำหรับแขกของกรมวิทยาศาสตร์การแพทย์นะคะเดี๋ยวขอเชิญเข้าประชุมที่ห้องสวีทชั้น3นะคะหลังอาหารกลางวันนะคะแล้วก็ยังมีอีกหนึ่งเรื่องค่ะ uh, so one one more thing ladies and gentlemen as we are going to change over the room for the afternoon section for this room we uh, we need to move the uh, full seat row at the back so please uh, I'm sorry for the convenience and please uh, move to the front a little bit. Thank you very much for your cooperation. And you can, if you'd like to attend for uh, the afternoon section in this room, you can leave your belongings over here, okay? All right, so please enjoy your break and come back again, see you at 1.30. Thank you.